Spencer, no one's saying anything. Let there be light. So, things, sign of blue sheets, as David Black observed. Oh, sorry. Sign the blue sheets, as David Black observed. It's your name and organization. I believe the emails are being captured during your registration. Um, and uh, you all have seen the note well during the registration process. I'm not going to read it over here. But uh, everything you say is important and meaningful to the IETF. And uh, you know the drill. Uh, any changes to the agenda? I know Spencer sent it out, bashed it a bit. Anything online? Anybody else? Okay. Who's besides Spencer is? Alex McDonald, Matt Benjamin, Tom Talpy, Tond, Mikkelbus, the Norwegian. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, all right, no changes agenda. We'll dive right in. That means Tom. So supposedly Do there's a pink like box up here that I'm supposed to remind you to stand in. So. I don't see a pink one. We'll go with the, the outline. It's it's your glasses. It's a pink one. Okay. <laughs> so I, I have one thing before. Martin Stimani, you're responsible, Eddie. Uh, uh, can you please state your name according to the sign? I just said it. Martin Stimali, you're responsible, Eddie. Oh, I thought it said But uh, Sorry, my voice is really like going almost okay. away. I will shut up for the rest of the session. So it's just <laughs> <Sorry>. like <laughs> my initial words on um, there is still a number of errata for many NFS v4 documents. And I would appreciate if the corresponding authors just look at the errata and let me know if this is like correct, if it's just stupid or uh, and then we can see that we get that out of the system and say uh, done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Yeah. Oh. All right. So we'll start with 4.2.
So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how many working group last calls we can go through. Uh, the good news is we've got implementations out there. People are um, putting running code behind this and they're finding issues. Uh, so for example, with the, the copy, uh, server-side copy, uh, we found it was useful to track some state across the destination back to the source. So we added in a state ID. Uh, we got rid of the NFS URL because we, you know, it was put forth in the original document for the, the copy many years ago. Uh, it's not been useful and we couldn't see anyone using it. Uh, so these have all spawned last calls. And then, VP, uh, could you advance? We, uh, at LSF in Boston a couple weeks ago, we were uh, talking not only with NFS implementers, but we were also talking with uh, some of the SCSI layer people, for example, and they pointed out that, uh, you know, instead of just doing a server-side copy where the, the copy could be asynchronous, you could implement a clone function, and the clone function would be uh, sort of the server could do cal, uh, copy on write, then just do it, it would return instantly, so you would get rid of all of the heavy mechanisms for tracking uh, the asynchronous operation, which was easier for the client. And we saw, for example, uh, Martin Peterson was talking about they were going to put it in for the SCSI layer in Linux. So uh, this is why we, we uh, uh, Christoph proposed a clone operation, right? Thanks. Yeah. Um, and now we've been asked on the working group alias, do we stay or do we go? Do we push uh, server-side copy and clone out of 4.2? And I can't recall whether they're asking for all of server-side copy or just the server-to-server -server one. Um, Bruce said it would be a great test for minor versioning. So Dave has got to talk on this a little bit later. And my response is, well, you know what? We almost have working implementations of the entire spec. I'd rather uh, tackle the issues, go on, get, get this out there, because either way, we're going to have some delay. Either we ax out some, some text and we have to go do another last call on it, or we add some text and we have to go do another last call on it. So pain-wise for me, it's the same. And I rather not do radical surgery at this point. So any questions on the state of 4.2? Okay. Any feelings one way or the other about uh, my, my intent is to keep this stuff in there and to push forward. Any strong objections? When you say this stuff, do you mean both? Both of them. Thank you, Chuck. I, I mean to include both the clone and the copy because uh, I also think that when we start out to do 4.2, we, we pointed out that we should be adaptive enough to take in something at the last moment that made sense and was well thought out. So we have a clone implementation or two already in the field, well, in Christoph's private branch that you can get to, right? Um, we know that other server vendors can support a clone operation easier than they can support a copy operation. And indeed, their copy operation might be a clone in the first place. Oh, and Chuck, I'm supposed to ask you to go to the microphone next time. I can feel the mental images. So, BP, I think that's it for that slide deck. Can we find another, please? So I, I just broke them all up into different slide decks that made sense. So I, I had more. I have like three more sets that went out last night. Okay. I defeated BP's organizational skills.
Uh, I mailed them out to, to Spencer, so they would have been up on the organizational site. Well, let me mail them to you now. Apologies, we're loading the slides. They are now online. They weren't five minutes ago. <laughs> okay. Um, which, so which one do you want next? Sorry. Uh, the staging or the, the docket. Sorry. I'm Doc has updates. Got it. All right, so we have two documents, uh, 7530 and 7531, which are going to be published any moment now, right? And I, I think they were evil because I thought I think they waited until they could get the 7530 ID so that we could confuse it with 3530 whenever we talk about the BIS and the non-BIS. Yeah, they do that deliberately. Yeah. So uh, next, please. Uh, the Al NFS registry, really interesting discussion about uh, whether it's specifically for NFS or whether it could be applied to all protocols. We went back and forth on that. It can be used by other protocols. The text has been changed. And we're basically waiting for a telechat slot to uh, pull this forward. Um, one of the things I'm not sure everyone's aware of is our ADs are overworked in this area. No, I, th this was something I wanted to, to point out that, you know, we. We have a lot of documents coming down the pipe at the same time, and there's going to be some delay. Yeah. Um, so I believe the next or the next slide deck. I think so. There's nothing else on this one, is there? I, I wrote it last night. Yeah, sure. We can do that one. So the good on the flex file. So the flex files is a new uh, PNFS layout type that we've proposed, and we sent it through working group last call. Uh, there was a client implementation in the Linux kernel that is now live, and we have three different server implementations in development. Uh, specifically, uh, Tigran at Desi is doing a Java-based one. Uh, Philippe Denel at uh, uh, with Ganesha is, is hacking it up to do something with Lustre. That's great. And then uh, primary data is doing an implementation. So that's the good. Uh, next, please. The bad, the working group last call. Uh, basically, uh, a confusion on the use of UID and GID for fencing. So the, the way that the um, 
the, the MDS enforces fencing with the DS is it uh, uses a UID and GID that's synthetic that it passes to the client for access and then the client can uh, apply these when it reads to the third party DS. So uh, the big confusion is this is labeled as a security model and it's not a security model. Uh, I take a large part of the blame on not changing the section title. I'll go ahead and do that in the next pass. But, uh, you know, everyone in the working group gets confused when they review the document. And that's a big, large red flag for me because I know when it goes outside the working group, there's going to be a lot of confusion as well with other people taking it as a security model and being concerned with it. So I need to go straighten that out. And now the ugly. Can we have the next, please? Fencing has interactions with Kerberized access. So in a NFSv3 world, we can, or a non-Kerberized world, actually, we can get away with this passing uh, a straight UID and GID. In a Kerberized world, we have to pass a principle. And the principle would be in the, you know, user at realm uh, uh, notation. Um, unfortunately, uh, if you look at flex files, with flex files, the, the DS is uh, something that's not owned by the same people who developed the NDS necessarily. So you can't make changes to the DS. So to have the, the client connect to the MDS with one user and then connect for writes and reads to the DSs as another user is problematic. Um, there have been several suggestions on how to do this with, you know, we'll, we'll uh, for example, make the MDS be a, a domain in itself and it hands out the tickets and credentials to the client. Uh, the other suggestion has been just to drop Kerberized access as a requirement. And I'm wanting to see winces in the crowd to see if people are paying attention. Is this something that will go forward in the IETF if we try to remove the Kerberized access? Well, you don't have to do that. Or Can we talk about You don't have to do it for the uh, the loose coupling case. You need so, to say your name. You know, the, the confusion that we keep having between Dave uh, Novak's talking between flex files and the loose coupling model. Okay. Maybe we have need to, at least in discussion keep those more separate. Right, but I, I still was wondering what the uh, you know we've had the requirement in in 3530 and in 5661 that curb the the all the implementations have to provide Kerberized access. The customer does not have to deploy it. Does that type of language still apply to? Okay. Mandatory uh, to implement. It's different between saying that NFC4 has to support it or any, and go going further and say any feature of NFC4 has to support it. And this, I wouldn't, I, don't, I think that would be taken too far. All right. So Martin is the AD, have you, or oh, Rich is going to? I'm uh, relying on uh, Trond and he says, uh, not on object or block. What? I'm relying on Trond and yeah. he says, uh, not on object or block. Okay. Do, uh, is there a requirement that we have to have the, secure, the higher security in place? I'm thinking uh, it mainly depends on you guys and what the in intended environment for this is. If you are okay saying we can just drop it and still have our level of comfort, then it's okay if you're, let's say, if you write one this like on a public hot place somewhere, then you might rethink about saying we need the higher level. Okay. But it's like, it's, it's wrong, we need to really judge it. Is like good judgment. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I think that's enough for that slide deck. Oh, the, it's simply, oh, the, you mean slide deck? Yeah. Um, 
it would be PNFS requirements for late. Yes. I did the separate slide deck so it would be easier for people later, not necessarily on you. So hang on. There's, uh, Spencer has uh, raised the question. Um, how does how, Tom? How do you want uh, to plan on? Uh, how do you plan on closing on Cabros? Uh, on the working group mailing list. Okay, good. So uh, we're talking about requirements for layout types. Uh, again, the, ba the the back history for this was that um, as people started to write new proposals for layout types, there were confusion in. 5661 from chapters 12 and 13, where uh, chapter 12 laid down the groundwork for what was a layout type, and then 13 presented the file layout, and it was hard to differentiate uh, the separation of the two for some people. Next slide, please. So it lives. Uh, it got past working group last call, and then Martin asked me to change it from info to standard. And actually, that was uh, we had had that discussion before we sent it up, and decided to to just see what Martin would ask for. So that added another working group last call. Uh, next, please. And I now I have a really great review of the of the draft. Uh, it happened a month ago, and I still need to read the the rest of the review and go through and address it. Uh, the upshot is we're going to need another working group last call. Know uh, that. Um, valid points, you know, so what was acceptable as an info might not be as acceptable as a standard. Um, just have to grind through uh, looking at the review and going through the comments. Any questions? I'm done. Yeah, done, done. So why are you changing decks? That's Martin Stimmeling speaking. Since we had the question about the NFS before LFS registry, so it's now on the telechat on April 9th. So just to let you know, I used the time to make it happen. What's that? So he's got the LFS. Nope. Okay. The FedFS ones. Right there on the upper. Okay, the upper uh, left. Yeah. Um, I wanted to really briefly bring people up to date on what's going on with VetFS documents. Um, um, next slide. There's uh, 
there are two documents. Uh, one is the FedFS admin protocol and one is the FedFS NSDB, NSDB protocol. Um, they've been um, clustered with uh, NFS v4.0 BIS and the XDR document. Uh, they've been assigned RFC numbers uh, and all authors have uh, authorized both documents. So they're ready to move forward. Next slide. Uh, I have two personal drafts. Um, they're tiny documents. They're on the data tracker website. Um, I'm sort of looking for some input about what is the next step for those documents. I think maybe moving them to working group. What's, uh, what's the opinion of the room? <coughs> No opinion, okay. Uh, they're short, they're only a few pages, so. Um, and unfortunately, they're kind of outside the expertise of the NFS group, uh, they're LDAP related. And uh, I heard some scurrilous rumors that the LDAP working group is going to be reformed, um, at least to work on a follow on to 2307, but uh, I'm not sure we can rely on those uh, experts for uh, commentary on these documents. So there is a there's an expertise gap here. Um, so that's why I'm kind of unsure about how to proceed. Okay, no opinion. I, should have one. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so maybe to send out pointers to the mailing list of the documents and ask for uh, Re review. Okay. Yeah, review and acceptance into the working group. Okay, we'll do. Okay, next slide deck. That would be uh, updating. Yeah, that one. The more stuff. We did this on purpose. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yes, I will try to go as fast as possible. No, no, honestly, I. <laughs> um, next slide. Okay, this is slide two. Um, you know, this is like playing a, a, a multi key or. Yes. Be thankful you don't have to work pedals too. <laughs> um, slide two. Um, so, slide two. I think we need to uh, agree that there's work to do here. Um, so, that's sort of the purpose of this slide is to come to a conclusion about what needs to be done with these documents because we think there are some uh, clarifications needed and in, in, uh, inadequacies and so I'm going to propose uh, a strategy, a framework for uh, updating these specifications and uh, hopefully we can get some agreement, some consensus on this. Um, slide three, please. Um, just really quickly, I'm going to uh, enter some useful definitions into our group consciousness here. Uh, so to start with, uh, there's uh, this idea of bulk payload, which is a, an RPC argument or result that it can be eligible for RDMA, which means that it can be transferred with an RDMA read or write. Um, the purpose being, an example of such an argument, it would be like a, um, uh, the data portion of a write, an NFS write. Uh, something that would benefit from speed up of, of uh, movement via direct placement. Um, so that's kind of a special treatment and so we have this idea of an upper layer binding which is a set of rules that's usually set out in a, a normative document that uh, um, require, uh, or not require, but there are, there are only particular operations, read and write being the two specific ones for NFS version 3 that are allowed to use a bulk payload. Um, and the upper layer binding also describes which RPC arguments or results uh, may be considered uh, uh, for a treatment as bulk payload. So basically everything is treated normally except for read and write and the data arguments therein uh, for our current uh, binding. You said NFS version 3? That's right. So RFC 5667 uh, is a upper layer binding for uh, NFS version 2 and 3, and it has a section 5, which is uh, binding for NFS version 4 and 4.1. Next slide. Um, so I'm unfortunately going to have to 
get a little detailed about uh, how this works um, so that uh, the, the following slides make more sense. So uh, an RDMA, an RPC over RDMA message consists of three components, uh, the RDMA header, uh, an RPC header, which is a normal RPC protocol header, and the upper layer protocol message, which is in our case, NFS. Um, and there's an inline portion, which is always sent via RDMA send, and that's just, just treated sort of like a datagram. Um, that always contains uh, the RPC over RDMA header. It may or may not contain the RPC header and the upper layer protocol message. I'll get into that in a minute. The RDMA header, the, the piece that's always sent in line, uh, contains uh, some uh, lists called chunks that describe the, the uh, bulk payload. Next slide. So the reason why those definitions were important is that we've got what's called an RDMA message and an RDMA no message type uh, RPC message, uh, which distinguishes between how the, the chunks are moved versus how the whole RPC message is moved. No message means the whole RPC, the RPC header, the upper layer protocol message, um, any, any data arguments and, or results are moved uh, via a chunk. With RDMA message, only the bulk payload is moved via RDMA transfer. Everything else goes in RDMA send. I know that's sort of hand, hand wavy at the moment, but uh, bear with me. So next slide. So here are our existing documents. Uh, these were clustered with uh, 5661 through 5665 uh, five years ago in 2010. Uh, we have uh, a document that describes RPC over RDMA. That's 5666. We have a document that describes the upper layer binding for NFS, which is 5667. Next slide. So um, after working on the Linux and Solaris implementations for 18 months, uh, we've kind of come to some conclusions about exactly how these need to work, uh, how RPC over RDMA needs to work. Um, that requires some clarifications to 5666. Um, we need to restrict uh, the behavior of RDMA no message, in my opinion, uh, so that um, it makes it, uh, so the requirements about this are more explicit to both uh, server and client uh, implementers. I'm not really going to go into details here, but uh, that's one thing. Uh, there, there, are others, there, there are other areas of the document that need some clarification. Uh, we don't think these uh, clarifications will require any changes to the protocol. I think that's probably the important thing. Uh, next slide. Um, there are some potential enhancements that would require some protocol changes. Uh, so I'm putting these on a separate slide so we can consider them uh, uh, separately. Um, Bidirectional RPC, I'm going to talk about a little later. Um, that will probably require some changes to the on-the-wire protocol. It may or it may not in the end, but I think it, it will require it. Um, there are some other features. Message chaining is instead of using uh, uh, RDMA read and write, we would build uh, large messages with uh, just by setting a bit in the in the inline portion that says, oh, by the way, the next the next message is also part of this one, so we can build quite large uh, messages just by using RDMA send. That, that is useful in some cases. Remote memory region invalidation is uh, where the client signals to the server, uh, would you please invalidate this memory region for me instead of me having to actually explicitly invalidate it once, once the operation is done. That is actually a performance enhancement, but and that also may or may not require wire protocol changes. Next slide. So to update uh, the RPC over RDMA specification, if we choose to do only the clarifications, we can use uh, the errata process to target narrowly the uh, text changes that we need to do, or we can create a single document uh, that updates that document that has all the changes we're interested in. Um, I kind of like option two. Um, so the bottom bullet point, if we have any interest in extending the protocol, we would do a, a protocol version bump and 
actually we would be forced to create a new normative document. So I guess what I'm asking is, do we have the stomach for uh, updating the RPC over RDMA protocol or do we just want to address the clarifications? Or do we have enough information to make that choice right now? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm volunteering. I think Tom will over, Tom Talpy will oversee or will participate as much as he can. Can I ask another a, you, a you, different type of question? You may. Yes. So, so does the mo you're presenting the possibility of extensions and changes to the protocol, motivated by use cases that are important to you? Yes. That you would desire these changes. So yes. they're not just like. That's you, right. Uh, okay, and you and Tom are kind of stepping up to do this? Yes, we are. Okay. David Black has approached the microphone. David Black, can we go back to the clarification slide? Because the answer might have been lurking in there and Chuck went through it. Okay. If you implement, I apologize, these, these are going to sound like process questions, and they are. If you implement according to 5666, does no message work? Um, if you understand the intent of the authors, then you can make it work. Um, however, there are some gray areas and leeways in the protocol specification that uh, would allow an implementer to choose um, to implement oh. something that wasn't would not interoperate with, okay. with the Let me current make implementations. Sure. Let me, okay. 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 Uh, Dave Novak asks if there are already inconsistent implementations. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Let me make sure the AD is online. So I'm about to rephrase what you said in AD speak. <laughs> I believe what you just said is that RFC 5666 is insufficiently specified to reliably yield interoperable implementations. Yes. If, okay. We, we, we believe that's true. Okay. Given that, Errata, is, errata are inappropriate, and you should plan to rev it and replace it with a spec that does get to interrupt implementations. I'm hoping the AD nods his head vertically. <laughs> I'm sorry? Okay, so the, the proposition is that 5666 has been insufficiently specified to yield interrupt implementations. The question on the floor is, can this be rectified via errata? I'm suggesting the answer is no. You actually need a doc that is actually interoperable as opposed to having to go look at the, at the errata to figure out what the authors might have read. Um, and before we go on, I think maybe we should hear from uh, Tom Talpy. I'm sure he has some comments about whether or not. We have implemented priority queuing at the microphone in the room. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's called preemption, you know. So, but there was the question for the 80s. So that's the 80s speaking, at least. Uh, I think errata is like way, when when somebody finds it, it can put into the errata system. But then if it's like something which is like really severe, like okay, we cannot talk to each other, then you should be doing a document update where you put RFC 56666 and the errata together, so that you have something which somebody can take, implement, and can talk to the other end. So the preference in the room is to do an update document if we're only talking about these clarifications. Um, we haven't answered the question of whether we would like to consider uh, further enhancements to the protocol. So I'm uh, relaying uh, Tom Telpi. Uh, first, uh, he agrees uh, to also pick up the work and uh, work on this uh, update document. And he also wants to comment that uh, 5666 is sufficient for NFS version uh, 2 and version 3, but it's insufficient for the compound operation of uh, version 4. David Black says bingo. <laughs> David, say, David Black says, okay, that, that that uh, comment related from, from Tom uh, to me is a smoking gun that says we need a 5666 bis that nails V4 to the floor because cl clearly, 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 clearly the current uh, 5666 doesn't do that. It's a little more complex than that, but yeah. Okay, so I, I think you've got a, got a, 
let's see, should leave it to the chairs to call sense of the room. But I, but, uh, I think we can figure out where this one, this one is heading. Discussion on what else to do while we're in there is the next question. And again, a uh, comment by Tom. Um, an update of uh, the document 5666 is, of course, OK. But strictly speaking, it is not necessary for version 2 and version 3. And it also needs an update to 5667 uh, to nail uh, version 4 on the floor, just as uh, David mentioned. Right, and uh, those are the next slides. <laughs> um, so, um, sorry, let me summarize something here. Okay. I, I believe we are converging on the doc has to be revved to address the um, inconsistencies or um, lack of precision in the current spec, regardless. So, boom, we're there. You have, you and Tom have proposal for additional work, which is certainly a little bit more than cleaning up the spec um, and clarifying things. Uh, I feel like I want to say make a proposal for the changes to the working group alias and a commitment to produce the verbiage and then start vetting it. Is that fair? Sounds okay to me. And I'm not going to stop you from working, right? Right? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, try next slide. Um, next slide. Oh, do we want to? Okay, you, I think you addressed that already. So next slide. Uh, so we're on slide 10 now. All right, so this is the sister document 5667, which is an upper layer binding for the NFS protocol. Um, section 5 uh, covers uh, the NFS v4.0 and 4.1 binding. We believe it is inadequate. Uh, there are at least two glaring errors. There's no symlink operation in NFS v4. Symlinks are created with uh, the create operation in v4. The language of section 5, though, calls out symlink, uh, so that's clearly an error. Um, and the language around uh, NFS v4 compound is ambiguous. Um, it's really not very clear whether uh, it says uh, basically uh, NFS v4 read is treated like the earlier bindings. And the problem is an NFS v4 compound is a, an array of operations. And, you know, if you sort of squint, you could consider one operation in a compound as uh, something that is uh, bulk RDMA, uh, bulk payload, which I think was not the intention of the, of the authors of the document. Um, so that's an, an ambiguity that can lead to uh, uh, non-interoperability that we would like to address. Um, there are a couple of other bullets on this slide, uh, which I will get to a little bit later. So let's move on to slide 11. So we think there are probably two options here. Uh, the first option is to uh, leave the uh, NFS v2 and v3 portion of 5667 alone and um, create an updates document, a normative document that would uh, uh, replace section 5 of 5667. Uh, the other option, um, question from the floor. Uh, I think another question. Uh, Tom just wanted to point out that uh, uh, since uh, 5667 was written, the compound operation has evolved, and uh, he agrees with me. Okay. The other option we have is to create a BIS. Um, that would copy, uh, copy the sections that we want to keep and replace the sections that we need to fix. Um, any sense from the floor what, how to proceed with this, whether to go with a repair or replace? I think our preference is to uh, to create a 5667 BIS. So, um, replying Tom, uh, replace. Uh, so uh, his preference obviously seems to be also to replace uh, the entire document. And uh, speaking as an author of another BIS document, 
I would also say it's probably easier for a new implementer to follow a full, a full spec in a separate document rather than figuring out which parts of which documents to put together. That is also my feeling that uh, uh, the RFC editor referred this as value to the reader uh, to collect all the errata and updates and and uh, fixes in one document. That's that's going to be the best outcome for our implementers. Is there a consensus? Uh, Tom and I are volunteering to work on on the BIS. So this document. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Um, so we identified some areas that are not uh, covered by these documents. Next slide. This is slide 13. Um, neither document addresses uh, the issues with um, operating uh, RPC sec um, over uh, RDMA transports. Um, there are some interesting questions, uh, not necessarily with the authentication only, but when you start talking about integrity checking and encryption, uh, that means the host CPU has to touch the bytes in the payload, which is uh, the reason why we like RDMA is because you don't have to, the host CPU doesn't have to touch the bytes in the payload. Um, the, the current Solaris implementation uses RDMA no message for integrity and, and encryption, uh, just because it has to touch all the bytes, and so there's really no purpose in in uh, doing a, a direct placement. Um, so, uh, go ahead. Uh, relying uh, uh, Matt Benjamin, um, he's asking uh, if it has any possible implementation. If what has any possible implementation? This particular, uh, I guess the ah, the offload part of uh, of this. Um, you would have to rely on the hardware to handle the uh, GSS uh, parts of the protocol. So I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Uh, next slide, slide 14. Um, NFS v4.2 does not have an upper layer binding. We have 4.0 and 4.1 in section 5 of 5067, but we don't have one for NFS v4.2. Uh, we think read plus would need uh, some discussion about, you know, are, are we going to allow all arms of all content arms to, to be transferred as bulk payload or only the, the data content arm. Uh, there may be other options, operations in for, that have been introduced in 4.2 that are interesting for uh, uh, consideration for uh, RDMA. Um, so we have, I put up uh, three uh, options for dealing with 4.2. Um, we kind of like I think Tom likes two. I don't really have a preference. Um, Dave, you liked, I think, one. One is, is uh, cover uh, the upper layer binding for 4.2 in the same document. We cover it, uh, zero, minor version zero and one. I really should be sitting down here next to the mic. Um, mm. Relying on Tom Telpe. Uh, he's okay with one or two. Yeah. So I, I had a question in general. How do you propose to, are you going to add some language to describe what happens as a new version comes out so that you're not covered by this problem in the future? So I thought about that a little bit. Um, maybe Talpi also has some opinions about it. I, my opinion is maybe it should be added to the minor versioning rules. There's nodding. Here in the room, does uh, does Tom Talpy have an opinion? So relying again, uh, there is language in RC 5666 requiring some document to cover this, but it does not specify which document. So it's uh, up to the decision here in the room. Okay. Uh, so do we feel up to changing the minor versioning rules to add uh, a requirement for an RDMA upper layer binding as part of new specifications? Well, 
featured definition document. Find that in your operation. Uh, Dave Novak says uh, the minor versioning rules should qualify the requirement to only if there is an operation that has a bulk payload argument or request or result. Sense of the room? Okay, no opinion. Can I ask you a favor? Um, so you got some opinions on a couple of things. Yeah. So I'm trying to write them down. Um, uh, when the minutes go out, review the uh, the notes um, where you didn't get closure. Let's do it on the alias. Um, okay. Uh, I, you know, just I had no sleep for about uh, understood 36 hours. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. So again, uh, uh, relaying uh, Tom, um, we could leave uh, some of these things open to interpretation, uh, but uh, perhaps discuss this uh, further in the process of updating uh, 5666. Okay, I think we'll move that to the mailing list. Uh, meanwhile, I think we have some rough consensus that, that option one on slide 14 is what we're going to do about NFSV 4.2 in specific. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. Uh, next slide. Um, this is slide 15. So I don't think um, we need to worry about data server uh, or data server operations because those will be covered by NFSV 4.1, which we're already going to fix up in a, in a 5667 BIS. But I think the metadata operations in NFSV 4.1 need to be visited specifically, um, especially the large uh, MDS operations probably need to be uh, covered by, by some language somewhere. I'm not sure they're RDMA eligible, but maybe we need to say that explicitly in some document. Now, next slide. Um, this would be additional work. Um, NFSV 4.1 on block is interesting because you can use it with ICER and SRP, which are block on RDMA protocols. Um, maybe there are no changes required for those. Um, but there are some interesting new persistent memory technologies that uh, would be very nice to include in a layout scheme. Again, I'm not qualified to discuss exactly what we what changes we'd need to layouts, but I think that's something that we need to keep on the radar screen going forward. I can't believe I just said that. Um, final slide. Um, are there any more open issues? Any discussion, further discussion? Okay. Um, I, rough, I, roughly speaking, when, so you, you go back, you send out the open issues to the mail list, but uh, you and Tom are volunteering to do the um, drafting. I, I feel this compelling compulsion inside me to ask, what, when, what, when do you expect to get something, uh, you know, uh, words out for start, people start to chew on? That's a very fair question. And in fact, if Spencer were here, he'd probably ask the same one. Um, I don't have an answer to, for that, but I would expect in the next six to nine months, we'd have some, some first draft. Probably, I'm not sure before the next IETF meeting, but maybe the meeting after that would be a good target. Okay. At, at, at least a, it would be really good for the next meeting to at least have the outline of the area that you are playing in and uh, just to keep the ball rolling and engaging the working group alias, okay, and maybe give an update. All right. Yes. Agreed. Okay. Uh, next, next presentation. <laughs> Just final comment from uh, Tom. Yes, agree uh, that an outline is uh, needed soonish.
RDMA uh, by direction. Bingo. First try. Got it. Okay. Uh, so the uh, uh, NFSB 4.1 specification requires implementations to implement a back channel. Um, we don't have such an implementation for uh, RDMA transports today. Um, there are two uh, interesting choices for for uh, that we consider for our uh, Solaris and Linux interoperation. Uh, the first one is that the the client uh, initiates a TCP connection to the server and the, uses it only for back channel operations. The other one uh, would be to plumb uh, bi-directional RPC support into the RDMA transport. Uh, so I today want to talk about these two and uh, describe a prototype that we built of uh, number two. Uh, next slide. So we initially uh, implemented a number one, uh, and the slide describes a little bit about how that would work. Uh, basically, it creates session time. The uh, the client, either the client or the server, can can advertise to the other that, oh, hey, I only have four channel support. Um, so once that transport is established and the create session succeeds, the server discovers, oh, wait a minute, there's no back channel, and asserts uh, the uh, CB path down st uh, sequence flag. Uh, the client sees that and then notices, that, oh, there's no forward channel support on this transport, so I will set up a separate TCP transport. Does a bind connection to session and then only does back channel operations on that transport. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, Tom has suggested that the CB path down piece of this isn't really necessary. No, it's not really necessary. It was a a choice for uh, this particular implementation. The Solaris TCP sidecar implementation does not use CB path down, but I figure we should use the same logic for initial connection that we would use for uh, uh, disconnect and recovery. So that's why I chose to do it this way. Uh, next slide. That's the sewage pipes being flushed. Or it's a very large basilisk of some kind, sort of slithering, <laughs> slithering by. Uh, there, there are for those on the uh, for those who are remote. There, are, there are noises that are going by our room that are rather ominous sounding. Um, so, slide four. There are some advantages and disadvantages to the sidecar approach. Uh, one, the probably the our favorite uh, pro is that um, we would require very few changes, if any, to NFS v 4.1 servers. They're already required to support sessions that use multiple transports. Uh, the disadvantage is that there would be some uh, work required in NFSV 4.1 clients to make this happen. Uh, this is not something that happens automatically in most implementations that we're aware of. Uh, next slide. So because of this, we decided to look at uh, adding bidirectional RPC support in RDMA transports. Um, we could use a single connection in that case that would support both the back channel and the four channel. So it would work exactly like the, uh, the TCP transports work today. Um, a disadvantage of this is that there are complex changes required uh, at the transport layer. Uh, I believe there are protocol changes needed, uh, but mm, that remains to be confirmed uh, with the with, uh, definition. Um, Tron suggested uh, another reason why we might want to try this prototype is that it would demonstrate whether or not our internal abstractions were capable of uh, supporting bidirection on a new and different uh, transport. So we decided to embark on a, on a prototype. I'm doing the Linux client implementation, and a colleague of mine at Oracle is implementing this in the Solaris server. Next slide. Um, the original RPC over RDMA protocol has a copy of the RPC XID in the RPC over RDMA header at a fixed location. Um, however, when a back channel request comes in to the client, the client's reply handler is looking at this and going, I don't recognize that XID. 
Um, so there needs to be some way that the reply handler has can look at this incoming message and go, oh, this is actually a back channel call. I don't have an XID for this, and I need to process it like a like a back channel call instead of like a four channel reply. So the easiest way to to do this detection of a call direction is to indicate it somehow in the RPC over RDMA header or at, at a fixed in a fixed field. Uh, uh, the RPC over RDMA header is varying length, and uh, in order to walk up the header and look into the RPC header, um, there that would require double parsing the RPC over RDMA header, and we don't want to do that. Uh, this is exactly why we have a copy of the XID in that header. So next slide. So what I did was I added a couple of uh, RPC over RDMA uh, message types. I don't think we need two. We could probably get away with one. Um, but this is the XDR change that I did for the prototype. And uh, Slide eight, please. Uh, another problem we had to deal with is uh, managing receive buffers on the client. Uh, today, the client posts a receive buffer for each outstanding RPC, so there are no receive buffers posted when there are no RPCs uh, outstanding. Um, we also have to think about um, what numbers to post in the uh, the credit field in the RPC of RDMA header um, and how those are counted for us uh, um, separately from the forward channel credits. Uh, next slide, please. So the way large RPC messages are sent between client and server is that they are, and by large I mean larger than the inline size, in other words, too large to be sent by uh, RDMA send, is that they are placed in a large buffer and an RDMA read or write is done by, this, by the uh, receiving end. And we kind of don't want to do that for a, uh, we don't want to do that for a back channel because that would require the client to actually do the RDMA read and write operation. Today, the server does all of those. Uh, that would expose client's memory to the server. We don't want to do that either. So for the prototype, we are restricting back channel operation only to messages that can be passed in line. So that's about a kilobyte. Um, so if we're going to consider a longer term solution, we'd like a way of sending messages that are unrestricted in size, especially if the back channel is going to be Kerberized uh, because uh, GSS does add quite a bit of uh, um, payload to the RPC header that would that could push these messages larger than the inline size. Anyway, that's something to think about going forward. Uh, slide 10, please. Um, yeah, this is probably not really interesting, so let's go to slide 11. As I mentioned before, there's some uh, uh, receive buffer handling that needs to be added on the client side at least. Um, the receive buffers are uh, fungible. That means they can either catch uh, an incoming forward channel reply or an, or an incoming back channel request. Um, the hardware basically picks whatever receive buffers next in line, uh, and that catches the send. So basically, we have to post enough receive buffers for both sets, the four channel and the back channel. Next slide. Um, and then we have to remember to repost the, the back channel receive buffers uh, after a transport reconnect. Otherwise, a disconnect would cause all those to go away and never come back. So notice that a bind connection to session prevents the server from sending back channel calls uh, before the client has had a chance to uh, actually post the receive buffers. I was a little worried about that race at first, but I think the upper layer is going to prevent the server from sending back channel calls before the client is ready. Uh, next slide. This is slide 13. Um, and this might be obvious to some who are looking at the situation, but the buffer sizes, the, the receive buffer sizes and send buffer sizes on both ends have to be exactly the same for both the forward channel and the back channel. So we have to have some mechanism for managing that size for both sides to agree on exactly how large these things can be. Uh, slide 14, please. So these are the challenges we've kind of identified in the prototype. Um, and I think 
taken together, it suggests that we do need some wire protocol changes to make this work well. Um, maybe folks have other ideas about how to fix these issues without a wire protocol change. I'd be interested in hearing those. Um, anyway, this I think this is the last slide. Is it the last slide? Yeah. Um, are there any questions? Richard? protocol changes, what level would they be at? Um, this would be changes to the protocol specified in uh, 5666, so RPC over RDMA. So again, relying on uh, Tom Telvey. Um, so if everyone agrees, uh, should these happen in the 5666 bis or a new document? Spencer? Spencer has left the room. <laughs> he has a conflict. Spencer, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> um, never response to that. <laughs> I think the usual process would be to defer this until we see some proposals. Okay. Okay, I'll just write down new doc or this open question. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you for the organized slides, by the way. Uh, there's another question. Uh, I guess uh, PP will hate this. Um, is there a process obstacle to this? Is, Say again. Is there a, sorry, uh, for uh, Matt Benjamin, I rely. Is there a process obstacle to this? I can definitively say that I do not know the answer to that question. Okay. Does somebody? I don't think there is. David. No, the other David. Uh, is there a process obstacle around doing a BIS approach to this work as opposed to a new document? I think is what the question is being asked, right? Okay, David, but let me make sure I understand the question. I, if I understood the question, it was effectively a um, should this be a this draft that replaces and and in effect obsoletes the obsoletes the old protocol well, versus just write a write an add-on draft that updates. I think writing a new draft that supersedes is what. That would be a bis, yeah. A bis would supersede. So, so you, okay. I think your process choices are you c is um, I'm I'm going to drop out of the 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 the, the IETF the IETF process speak. I think your process choices are replace the existing doc wholesale or write an add-on doc that explains what, what, what gets added to make the existing one run, run, run bidirectionally. Is that the question? Yes. I, th I think the uh, requirement here would be that we'd have to bump the RPC of RDMA version protocol and that would require a new document. Whether that's an updates or an obsoletes, I'm not sure, but I think that's probably going to be an obsoletes. Or maybe we if actually have to replace the, it. If we the only way to negotiate this is to bump the master rev number, then I think what happens is you leave the existing dock in place and you don't obsolete it, and you write a new one that is the new and improved grand glorious shining version the same way that that uh, the v4 docs did not obs did should not have obsoleted the v3 docs I don't, I don't believe they did so um, you can play the same game here where you've got more than one more than one version valid you will need to put text into the new doc that it, that that makes it absolutely positively clear how down negotiation to the old rev works when I've got a new one and an old one that want to talk to each other I think there's language in 5666 already that describes the, the downright process. Yeah. So again, relying on uh, uh, Tom Telpe. Um, so he, he comments that this is a two-step, perhaps. 
and uh, there are uh, more urgent issues um, which uh, may require the BIS for the other ones and uh, so an, an additional uh, um, document for this particular change and ah, and uh, RFC uh, 5666 BIS does not require a new version. David Black, the other reason of a comment on uh, perhaps writing a separate doc is that some of what I think I've heard you say, Chuck, I'm trying, trying to follow along and, and do email at the same time I realize that's, that's not a best practice, <laughs> makes it sound like what the right thing to do might be is to write up the protocol that includes the bidirectional RPC, bump the version number, and publish as experimental. I think that would be a separate document. I think we I think we want Abyss to fix the problems in the original version one of this RPC protocol. Okay, in which case you should keep the stuff that you're not sure about separate from whatever standards track doc fixes the bugs. Somewhat I'm, I'm pretty sure I've heard in bidirectional is suggesting to me that the bidirectional stuff ought to be spec so people can implement it and tagged as experimental because I'm pretty sure I heard you say you're not quite sure what's going to happen when you follow this into, into implementations. Well, there are some, there are certain open questions like how we're going to deal with large messages, for example. So yes, an experimental document sounds like a good plan to me okay. that's quite separate from the, from the uh, BIS document, uh, BIS uh, 5666. We have to fix the version one problem separately, yes. Agreed. So, so you, you, you put the stuff into the straight BIS docs that you know is busted, you, you know has to fix, you know has to be fixed or done right to get V4 to work. And then if this bidirectional stuff is, we want to dig here, we want to write initial spec for how to dig so everybody's got something to work from so we can figure out whether it works or not. Yes. That's, that, that's the kind of thing an experimental RFC is good for. Okay. Thank you. So, um, hopefully, the final comment from uh, Tom. So uh, Tom agrees uh, to keep the bidirectional uh, experimental and therefore in a separate draft. So basically what we just uh, have discussed. Um, and uh, however, uh, we need to explore the callback issues and reserve the right to change our mind. Yes. Okay. I think we need to move on. So, yeah. Sorry. Uh, NFS version 4 management. Hold on. Get ready. <laughs> Just to explain what's going on, I have a set of documents labeled dash zero, dash one, dash two, dash three. And is any, are, are any of those labeled BIS? No, <laughs> no. Wait a minute, Oh, was, this, was that the thing you just said? Yes. title, so next slide. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be talk, talking about two documents. One is uh, the, uh, the is currently working group document, of the, the initial version of the uh, NFC4 versioning document that uh, you know, Tom and I are working on. And also a, per, a, per, uh, uh, a personal draft, which is uh, the O2 of uh, NFS extension. We're going to talk about why I think we're here. How we how we got here and how we can move forward in this area, and uh, so that's the summary. Next slide. So uh, we have a working group document, and I think a lot of people want to turn that into an RFC and as soon as possible. But I think as soon as possible is not as soon as people might think because there's a fair number of things that we have to do, including building some consensus on. We'll talk about that in the working group list. There are four major elements in, this, in the current document. One is the concept of XDR extension. And the second is you take that com concept and use it to be able to avoid 
batching the features as we have done with minor versioning and have ex the concept of extensible minor version versions, allowing you to just generate a new uh, feature di definition document and have that be a appended automatically to the protocol. Also addresses the issue of correcting protocol XDR if we find out that despite the fact we've, we've uh, done more work as far as prototype implications, we may find out that something doesn't work or two features don't work well together. We may have to at some point face the problem of changing, of revising the protocol, including the protocol XDR and how we can and it address how we can do that. And also it uh, gets out, we get out of the, pro the, the habit that we had of having separate minor versioning rules in every, in every minor version and now we've moved to, toward having one list of those and uh, based, currently they're based on those in RFC 5661. So uh, this, I, I updated this, this, this document. Uh, it had expired, it was about a year old. And basically I updated to reflect the changes over the last year. A lot of things that I said were happening in the future or now have happened or in the process of happening. And we need to focus, those are in that working group document. And now we're free to focus on what we have to do to put those in an RF, into an RFC. And also, in the process of writing that, I made one big discovery about NFSB 4.1. There are a number, a fair number, of non-XDR-based change changes. And the minor versioning rules are all about XDR-based changes. And if version management has to address them somehow, if one way to address them is say, gee, you can't do them. Another way is to say them, you can, you can do them, but there's certain restrictions to prevent yourself from going crazy. Anyway, the working group needs to decide that and that's the kind of thing we'll be discussing on the mailing list. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, so this is my current best guess of why we are where we are. Well, first of all, we needed a protocol that could grow, and we knew that major versioning just wouldn't work anymore. It was just too, too disruptive. Someone came up with the XDR. I'm not sure who actually came up with this fundamental idea, but it was a good idea, XDR extension. And it was overshadowed by the idea of minor versioning. We started big, building these big minor versions and it doesn't, wasn't working very well. We never really put adequate effort into version management as a, as a to topic. It was all, always an afterthought. And it, you know, addressing specific features, specific needs seemed more important at the time. And the issue of the size of the specs that were generated was not on our radar. And, you know, it should have been on our radar. And we've, you know, that's been a factor that we've had to deal with. We've, uh, you know, we were going through the process of publishing the BIS and everyone said, oh my God, this is, this is 300 pages. And I heard that a number of times and said, well, gee, I, th I thought it was small because it wasn't 600 pages. But to the people who were reviewing it, they said, 300 pages, this is just enormous. Anyway, so how we got here? Well, we started with a 300-page document. It had to be a 300-page document. It was a major version. We had to have, or thought we had to have one big doc. And somehow, RFC 5661 was 600 pages. And you know, there's a couple of, uh, down here was a couple of, uh, couple of uh, quotes from the abstract of 5661. It's a considered a separate protocol. It wasn't always considered a separate, it is a separate protocol. And it said it was deemed superior. Well, maybe it is superior, but anyway, we got 600 pages of space, and we, after that experience, although uh, I guess we decided, or the ISG decided for us, that you're the no, no, not going to be pro, not going to be uh, specs that are that large. And then we tried V4.2. That was a spec that was under 100 pages, and still took four years. I said four years because I'm assuming it's not going to go on and as a result of the sequence of last calls we have, but it's not going to be much more than four years, but still it's four years. We decided we had to take version management more seriously than we had. And that's part of the, that's basically the essence of this, this effort. So, uh, so uh, in the, in the NFS extension 00, I, I put forth the, uh, the uh, concept of XDR extension. It was really the core idea at the, the idea at the core of the original minor version rules. It, when you think about it, it allows incremental protocol extension. That's a great thing. But for some reason, 
we got that uh, concept of extension was tied to the creation of minor version, versions. And unfortunately, the production of large, or in case of the Fortitude, they weren't, the documents weren't that large, but the, the effort was enormous. So we're now in the long process of digging out of that situation. And the idea of the NFSV4 version manager RFC is to retain the XDR extension concept and then tie it from minor version creation and large documents. Uh, next slide. So we've somehow addr we've addressed the batching of features by the concept of extensible versions. This allows us to address minor versions like NFS 4.2 more expeditiously. We could make the specs even shorter. As Tom points out, 10 10-page feature specs is a lot better or easier to manage than one 100-page minor version spec. And also, if there's a problem with one thing, it doesn't hold up everything else. We also want to prevent premature decisions as to, con uh, as to the content of the minor version and make those decisions about what goes in into the protocol only after the feature has a clear design and sufficient implementation work has been done. Also, we had to address, I guess Tom really pushed me to, uh, to get this in to address this, to address the issue of protocol correction. Fixing protocol bugs is hard because you need to accommodate, you know, existing clients and existing servers, both each of which may have the new or the old behavior or both. And, and you, to do that, you can make the old and new server behaviors alternative features and the client can test for the presence of support. That's a good fit to the XDR extension model if you're willing to extend the XDR. And therefore, the idea that you can extend the XDR in that way is a good fit for that, and maybe if we have to face that, I hope we don't have to face that problem, but we may have to, and we have to be ready to, ready to address that. So uh, the minor version rules in this document are currently based on those that are C5661. And there's some lingering issues that we have. One is the thing of recommended versus cap capital recommended. And uh, this was a problem when we, when we were reviewing uh, the, third, the BIS, okay. Uh, in fact, if you looked at the front page of, of the new RFC, it says, well, the terms, you know, these ter 2919 terms is used as defined as 2919 except the words recommended and required when used about classes of attributes. It doesn't say what it means, but it's cl pretty clear that's not what, what was meant by 2119. Also, another thing was that it's about, in, this is this weird paragraph in the uh, existing rules about infrastructural features. And uh, I can't make, could make sense of it, but basically it says that, well, you must not make uh, a feature required when it's introduced, except if it's really big and complicated and hard to implement. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, also through the, going through these, through these, uh, through the thing is this, this feature maturation model. It was never realized and maybe we'll have to somehow address the rules to, to reflect that fact. There are a couple of structural, a number of structural issues that have to address. What are called features in those rules are really what, we, what I would call change elements. And we later, I think Tom's work, came up with the concept of features at a set of chain, related changes. And that's the best way to document them. Uh, the rules now deal, deal with minor versions, not with features and changes, and so we need to reorganize the rules to do that and also somehow address the issue of non-XDR-based changes. Next slide. So the basic decision to be made is, you know, we've had, we've had well, we had v4.0, which wasn't really a minor version, it was a major version. Then we had v4.1, which was an enormous thing, which, I mean, some people in the ISG said, well, maybe it should be called NFS v v5. Well, maybe it should have, but that's water over the pipe. Under the bridge. Anyway, uh, so v4.2 was a good model to do things, and we wanted to do it better, better and quicker, quicker. And that was the goal, original goal, of the uh, the XDR extension concept. And then we have NFA 4.1 in this in this context is the hundred-year flood of minor versions. Maybe we don't want to have that again. But where do we want to draw the line between what is valid as a minor version and what isn't? One point of view is to say, gee, they should only be minor versions, they should only be like before that too. And I, th I think that's, a, that's, that's not, I think that's not what we want to do from the working group will have to decide. 
the working group needs to dis discuss and come to consensus about that. First thing that we'll probably definitely have to say is, as a way of, spe as a way of limiting things, is you cannot respecify the, the entire protocol. Is that the only restriction we'd need? Are there other restrictions about what you can do? And I think there'll be some discussion of that. Uh, next slide. So here's some individual decisions. Look at the things that were done in 4.1 and were not done in 4.2. Introduce required features. One thing you could do is just ban those, absolutely. Another thing that says, well, gee, if they're small enough and well controlled enough, maybe you can do that. Another thing that's done, allowed in the, the rules are changing a feature stat statuses, including making things mandatory to not implement it. Uh, maybe you want to ban that, maybe you don't want to ban that. Other things, non XDR based base changes. For each of those possible things, you have to di allow them, disallow them, or allow them with some restrictions. And there'll be some discussion about that. So in, uh, in, the, in the next draft of the document, in the, uh, uh, we need to reorganize the, reorganize the rules because the current rules just deal with minor versions. And they have, I talk about layering rules, rules of what are the valid changes, how do you organize them into features? What are the rules about how you incorporate features into the protocol? And so we'll have some, we we'll hope we'll have some comments and suggestions about that. I think that's it. Okay. And, sorry. Um, so you updated the old doc on my tracking. You resurrected it or what? I resurrected okay. it. And uh, um, are you going to down the alias? Anyway, what's up? It's posted and you're, or you're going to post it and are any changes expected? Has it gone to the alias yet? Sorry. Well, I, I, I took the, the announcement and, and, and referred it to the alias. And I think that, you know, I don't think any changes in that. The next step, I think, is to take the working group doc and come out with a dash or one of it. Now, I don't know okay. whether we, I don't think we're going to, I think we have, need some working group discussion before we do that. It's okay. not going to reach consensus, but I think I need to get some sense of what people want to see before I come up with the thing, and then we can use that as, a, as, a, as something that people can shoot at. Okay. Can, can, can you take, uh, send out uh, ticklers to the mail list uh, to get people's attention and get the comments back to you before you? Sure. Okay. So I'll do that. And, uh, with, uh, with your expectation of you're not looking for perfection, but you're looking for feedback. Yep. Okay. Okay. Questions? Comments? Tom, anything on the... Uh, Okay. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Approval of new working group documents? Working group chairs? Yeah. So uh, I think that might be related to, uh, we've had several requests come in. Uh, for example, the Christoph's personal document. The SCSI one? Yeah, the SCSI one. And on the alias, we had seen, uh, we've had a call for it to become a working group document. We saw Several responses of support, no dissension. No, that was uh, the Xadder one. That's a different issue. I think we're seeing dissension on it, and I'd rather not make the decision myself. I'd rather it be done in the, the alias. So I don't think there's any slides for this. So, so what about the Sorry. So, this is only Christoph's document? So uh, there's Christoph's document, and then there's the Exeter document. Christoph's document has had no discussion or dissent. The Exeter document has had a lot of discussion and no sense of approval yet.
Um, so uh, any dissension here? So uh, declaration of consensus to adopt Christoph's document for a working group work. Yep. Okay. And, and then and then um, uh, circle back on the uh, the X adder. X adder doc. X adder doc. On alias, um, what's your sense of it? What does it need to converge to Fisher cut state? What's needed? Um, they, they did come up with requirements, but now there's discussion about the technical merits. Okay. Okay. Um, Spence for our contact author. There's a question from uh, Tom again. Um, is the X Etcher document already a working group item? X? No. No. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, I have Spencer and I will um, try to guide the uh, X adder document forward to uh, up or down, okay? Uh, is there, we are at the end unless somebody, went a little out of order. We're at the end, I think, of all the presentations. Does anybody believe that, that they have to say something here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's not a big thing. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm unclear about the status of, of the migration uh, document. I think it, I'm pretty sure it went through the last call. I'm not sure what the, what the process of, of, of what state of the process it, it is. This may be part of the AD over, uh, overwork issue. I don't know, but I'd like it not to be dropped. Um, is that yes? It's what? But it is not a queue somewhere, I just don't want it to get lost. Uh, it's what? It's in queue. Okay, great. Okay. Document. The document is in queue, according to Martin. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to ask that question again. So I would, <laughs> I would uh, if you haven't signed the blue sheet, sign the blue sheet. I think everybody did. I think I, everybody, I saw everybody put the pen in hand, expressing their support of the NFS version 4 working group, ensuring that we will always get a room slightly larger than a closet for our meetings. Uh, <laughs> 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 yes. We, I don't know what the hell is going on behind the walls over there. Uh, large Texas rats. Anyway, on that note, <laughs> um, <laughs> everything's bigger in Texas. Um, there's no uh, further um, discussion. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Enjoy the rest of the conference, please. And uh, I'll see you uh, next meeting. Is the next meeting in? Clog. Okay. So all the people that didn't show up at Dallas, they're saving up all their little trips for the Europe boondoggle. Is that what the deal is here? Oh, did I touch a nerve on something? <laughs> okay. Bye, guys. <laughs>